Having infused by persistent importunities some sort of heat into the chilly interest of several licensed victuallers, the acquaintances once upon a time of her late unlucky husband, Mrs. Verloc's mother, had at last secured her admission to certain almshouses founded by a wealthy innkeeper for the destitute widows of the trade. This end conceived in the astuteness of her uneasy heart, the old woman had pursued with secrecy and determination. That was the time when her daughter Winnie could not help passing a remark to Mr. Verloc that mother has been spending half crowns and five shillings almost every day this last week in cab fares. But the remark was not made grudgingly. Winnie respected her mother's infirmities. She was only a little surprised at the sudden mania for locomotion. Mr. Verloc, who was sufficiently magnificent in his way, had grunted the remark impatiently aside, as interfering with his meditations. These were frequent, deep, and prolonged. They bore upon a matter more important than five shillings, distinctly more important, and beyond all comparison, more difficult to consider in all aspects with philosophical serenity. Her object attained an astute secrecy. The heroic old woman made a clean breast of it to Mrs. Verloc. Her soul was triumphant, and her heart tremulous. Inwardly she quaked, because she dreaded and admired the calm, self-contained character of her daughter Winnie, whose displeasure was made redoubtable by a diversity of dreadful silences. But she did not allow her inward apprehensions to rob her of the advantage of venerable placidity conferred upon her outward person by her triple chin, the floating ampleness of her ancient form, and the impotent condition of her legs. The shock of the information was so unexpected that Mrs. Verloc, against her usual practice when addressed, interrupted the domestic occupation she was engaged upon. It was the dusting of the furniture in the parlor behind the shop. She turned her head towards her mother. "'Whatever did you want to do that for?' she exclaimed, in scandalized astonishment. The shock must have been severe to make her depart from that distant and uninquiring acceptance of facts, which was her force and her safeguard in life. Weren't you made comfortable enough here? She had lapsed into these inquiries, but next moment she saved the consistency of her conduct by resuming her dusting, while the old woman sat scared and dumb under her dingy white cap and lusterless dark wig. When he finished the sofa, and ran the duster along the mahogany at the back of the horsehair sofa, on which Mr. Verloc loved to take his ease in hat and overcoat. She was intent on her work, but presently she permitted herself another question. How in the world did you manage it, mother? As not affecting the inwardness of things, which it was Mrs. Verloc's principle to ignore, this curiosity was excusable. It bore merely on the methods. The old woman welcomed it eagerly, as bringing forward something that could be talked about with much sincerity. She favored her daughter by an exhaustive answer, full of names, and enriched by side comments upon the ravages of time, as observed in the alteration of human countenances. The names were principally the names of licensed victuallers. Poor daddy's friends, my dear. She enlarged, with special appreciation, on the kindness and condescension of a large brewer, a baronet, and an MP, the chairman of the governors of the charity. She expressed herself thus warmly, because she had been allowed to interview by appointment as private secretary, 
a very polite gentleman, all in black, with a gentle, sad voice, but so very, very thin and quiet. He was like a shadow, my dear. Winnie, prolonging her dusting operations till the tale was told to the end, walked out of the parlor into the kitchen, down two steps, in her usual manner, without the slightest comment, shedding a few tears in sign of rejoicing at her daughter's mensitude in this terrible affair, Mrs. Verloc's mother gave play to her astuteness in the direction of her furniture, because it was her own, and sometimes she wished it hadn't been. Heroism is all very well, but there are circumstances when the disposal of a few tables and chairs, brass beds, and so on, may be big with remote and disastrous consequences. She required a few pieces herself, the foundation which, after many importunities, had gathered her to its charitable breast, giving nothing but bare planks and cheaply papered bricks to the objects of its solicitude. The delicacy guiding her choice to the least valuable and most dilapidated articles passed unacknowledged because Winnie's philosophy consisted in not taking notice of the inside of facts. She assumed that Mother took what suited her best. As to Mr. Verloc, his intense meditation, like a sort of Chinese wall, isolated him completely from the phenomena of this world of vain effort and illusory appearances. Her selection made... The disposal of the rest became a perplexing question in a particular way. She was leaving it in Brett Street, of course, but she had two children. Winnie was provided for by her sensible union with that excellent husband, Mr. Verloc. Stevie was destitute and a little peculiar. His position had to be considered before the claims of legal justice and even the promptings of partiality. The possession of the furniture would not be in any sense a provision. He ought to have it, the poor boy, but to give it to him would be like tampering with his position of complete dependence. It was a sort of claim which she feared to weaken. Moreover, the susceptibilities of Mr. Verloc would perhaps not brook being beholden to his brother-in-law for the chairs he had sat on. In a long experience of gentlemen lodgers, Mrs. Verloc's mother had acquired a dismal but resigned notion of the fantastic side of human nature. What if Mr. Verloc suddenly took it into his head to tell Stevie to take his blessed sticks somewhere out of that? A division, on the other hand, however carefully made, might give some cause of offense to Winnie. No, Stevie must remain destitute and dependent, and at the moment of leaving Brett Street she had said to her daughter, No use waiting till I am dead, is there? Everything I leave here is altogether your own now, my dear. Winnie, with her hat on, silent behind her mother's back, went on arranging the collar of the old woman's cloak. She got her handbag, an umbrella, with an impassive face. The time had come for the expenditure of the sum of three and sixpence on what might well be supposed the last cab drive of Mrs. Verloc's mother's life. They went out at the shop door. The conveyance awaiting them would have illustrated the proverb that truth can be more cruel than caricature, if such a proverb existed. Crawling behind an infirm horse, a metropolitan hackney carriage drew up on wobbly wheels with a maimed driver on the box. This last peculiarity caused some embarrassment. Catching sight of a hooked iron contrivance, 
protruding from the left sleeve of the man's coat. Mrs. Verloc's mother lost suddenly the heroic courage of these days. She really couldn't trust herself. What do you think, Winnie? She hung back. The passionate expostulations of the big-faced cabman seemed to be squeezed out of a blocked throat. Leaning over from his box, he whispered with mysterious indignation, What was the matter now? Was it possible to treat a man so? His enormous and unwashed countenance flamed red in the muddy stretch of the street. Was it likely they would have given him a license, he inquired desperately, if the police constable of the locality quieted him by a friendly glance, then addressing himself to the two women without marked consideration, said, He's been driving a cab for twenty years. I never knew him to have an accident. Accident, shouted the driver in a scornful whisper. The policeman's testimony settled it. The modest assemblage of seven people, mostly underage, dispersed. Winnie followed her mother into the cab. Stevie climbed on the box. His vacant mouth and distressed eyes depicted the state of his mind in regard to the transactions which were taking place. In the narrow streets, the progress of the journey was made sensible to those within by the near fronts of the houses gliding past slowly and shakily with a great rattle and jingling of glass as if about to collapse behind the cab and the infirm horse with the harness hung over his sharp backbone flapping very loose about his thighs appeared to be dancing mincingly on his toes with infinite patience. Later on, in the wider space of Whitehall, all visual evidences of motion became imperceptible. The rattle and jingle of glass went on indefinitely in front of the long treasury building, and time itself seemed to stand still. At last, Winnie observed, this isn't a very good horse. Her eyes gleamed in the shadow of the cab, straight ahead, immovable. On the box, Stevie shut his vacant mouth first, in order to ejaculate earnestly, Don't! The driver, holding high the reins, twisted around the hook, took no patience. Perhaps he had not heard. Stevie's breast heaved. Don't whip! The man turned slowly, his bloated and sodden face of many colors, bristling with white hairs. His little red eyes glistened with moisture. His big lips had a violet tint. They remained closed. With the dirty back of his whip hand, he rubbed the stubble sprouting on his enormous chin. You mustn't, stammered out Stevie violently. It hurts. Mustn't whip, queried the other in a thoughtful whisper, and immediately whipped. He did this not because his soul was cruel and his heart evil, but because he had to earn his fare. And for a time the walls of St. Stephen's, with its towers and pinnacles, contemplated in immobility and silence a cab that jingled. It rolled too, however, but on the bridge there was a commotion. Stevie suddenly proceeded to get down from the box. There were shouts on the pavement. People ran forward. The driver pulled up, whispering curses of indignation and astonishment. Winnie lowered the window and put her head out, white as a ghost. In the depths of the cab, her mother was exclaiming in tones of anguish, Is that boy hurt? Is that boy hurt? Stevie was not hurt. He had not even fallen. But excitement, as usual, had robbed him of the power of connected speech. He could do no more than stammer at the window. Too heavy, too heavy. Winnie put out her hand onto his shoulder. Stevie, get up 
on the box directly and don't try to get down again. No, no, walk, must walk. In trying to state the nature of that necessity, he stammered himself into utter incoherence. No physical impossibility stood in the way of his whim. Stevie could have managed easily to keep pace with the infirm dancing horse without getting out of breath, but his sister withheld her consent decisively. The idea, who ever heard of such a thing, run after a cab. Her mother, frightened and helpless in the depths of the conveyance, entreated, Oh, don't let him, Winnie. He'll get lost. Don't let him. Certainly not. What next? Mr. Verloc will be sorry to hear of this nonsense. Stevie, I can tell you he won't be happy at all. The idea of Mr. Verloc's grief and unhappiness acting as usual powerfully upon Stevie's fundamentally docile disposition, he abandoned all resistance and climbed up again on the box with a face of despair. The cabbie turned at him his enormous and inflamed countenance truculently. Don't you go for trying the silly game again, young fellow. After delivering himself thus in a stern whisper, strained almost to extinction, he drove on, ruminating solemnly. To his mind, the incident remained somewhat obscure, but his intellect, though it had lost its pristine vivacity in the benumbing years of sedentary exposure to the weather, lacked not independence or sanity. Gravely, he dismissed the hypothesis of Stevie being a drunken young nipper. Inside the cab, the spell of silence in which the two women had endured shoulder to shoulder the jolting, rattling, and jingling of the journey had been broken by Stevie's outbreak. Winnie raised her voice. You've done what you wanted, mother. You'll have only yourself to thank for it, if... You aren't happy afterwards, and I don't think you'll be. That I don't. Weren't you comfortable enough in the house? Whatever people think of us, you throwing yourself like this on a charity. My dear, screamed the old woman, earnestly above the noise, you've been the best of daughters to me. As to Mr. Burlock there, Words failing her on the subject of Mr. Verloc's excellence, she turned her old tearful eyes to the roof of the cab. Then she averted her head on the pretense of looking out the window, as if to judge of their progress. It was insignificant, and went on close to the curbstone. Night, the early dirty night, the sinister, noisy, hopeless and rowdy night of South London had overtaken her on her last cab drive. In the gaslight of the low-fronted shops her big cheeks glowed with an orange hue under a black and mauve bonnet. Mrs. Verloc's mother's complexion had become yellow by the effect of age and from a natural predisposition to biliousness, favored by the trials of a difficult and worried existence, first as wife, then as widow. It was a complexion that under the influence of a blush would take on an orange tint, and this woman, modest indeed, but hardened in the fires of adversity, of an age, moreover, when blushes are not expected, had positively blushed before her daughter. In the privacy of a four-wheeler on her way to a charity cottage, one of a row, which by the exiguity of its dimensions and the simplicity of its accommodation might well have been devised in kindness as a place of training for the still more straitened circumstances of the grave she was forced to hide from her own child a blush of remorse and shame. Whatever people will think, 
she knew very well what they did think, the people Winnie had in her mind, the old friends of her husband, and others, too, whose interest she had solicited with such flattering success. She had not known before what a good beggar she could be, but she guessed very well what inference was drawn from her application. On account of that shrinking delicacy, which exists side by side with aggressive brutality and masculine nature, the inquiries into her circumstances had not been pushed very far. She had checked them by a visible compression of the lips and some display of an emotion determined to be eloquently silent and the men would become suddenly incurious after the manner of their kind. She congratulated herself more than once on having nothing to do with women, who, being naturally more callous and avid of details, would have been anxious to be exactly informed by what sort of unkind conduct her daughter and son-in-law had driven her to that sad extremity. It was only before the secretary of the great brewer, M.P., and chairman of the charity, who, acting for his principal, felt bound to be conscientiously inquisitive as to the real circumstances of the applicant, that she had burst into tears outright, and aloud, as a cornered woman will weep. The thin and polite gentleman, after contemplating her with an air of being struck all of a heap, abandoned his position under the cover of soothing remarks. She must not distress herself. The deed of the charity did not absolutely specify childless widows. In fact, it did not by any means disqualify her. But the discretion of the committee must be an informed discretion. One could understand very well her unwillingness to be a burden, etc., etc. Thereupon, to his profound disappointment, Mrs. Verloc's mother wept some more, with an augmented vehemence. The tears of that large female, in a dark dusty wig and ancient silk dress, festooned with dingy white cotton lace, were the tears of genuine distress. She had wept because she was heroic and unscrupulous and full of love for both her children. Girls frequently get sacrificed to the welfare of boys. In this case, she was sacrificing Winnie. By the suppression of truth, she was slandering her. Of course, Winnie was independent and need not care for the opinion of people that she would never see and who would never see her whereas poor Stevie had nothing in the world he could call his own except his mother's heroism and unscrupulousness. The first sense of security following on Winnie's marriage wore off in time, for nothing lasts, and Mrs. Verloc's mother and the seclusion of the back bedroom had recalled the teaching of that experience which the world impresses upon a widowed woman. But she had recalled it without vain bitterness. Her store of resignation amounted almost to dignity. She reflected stoically that everything decays, wears out in this world, that the way of kindness should be made easy to the well-disposed, that her daughter Winnie was a most devoted sister and a very confident wife indeed. As regards Winnie's sisterly devotion, her stoicism flinched. She accepted that sentiment from the rule of decay, affecting all things human and some things divine. She could not help it. Not to do so would have frightened her too much. But in considering the conditions of her daughter's married state, she rejected firmly all flattering illusions. She took the cold and reasonable view that the less strain put on Mr. Verloc's kindness, 
the longer its effects were likely to last. That excellent man loved his wife, of course, but he would, no doubt, prefer to keep as few of her relations as was consistent with the proper display of that sentiment. It would be better if its whole effect were concentrated on poor Stevie, and the heroic old woman resolved on going away from her children as an act of devotion and as a move of deep policy. The virtue of this policy consisted in this. Mrs. Verloc's mother was subtle in her way. That Stevie's moral claim would be strengthened. The poor boy, a good, useful boy, if a little peculiar, had not a sufficient standing. He had been taken over with his mother, somewhat in the same way as the furniture of the Belgravian mansion had been taken over, as if on the ground of belonging to her exclusively. What will happen, she asked herself. For Mrs. Verloc's mother was in a measure imaginative when I die. And when she asked herself that question, it was with dread. It was also terrible to think that she would not then have the means of knowing what happened to the poor boy. But by making him over to his sister, by going thus away, she gave him the advantage of a directly dependent position. This was the more subtle sanction of Mrs. Verloc's mother's heroism and unscrupulousness. Her act of abandonment was really an arrangement for settling her son permanently in life. Other people made material sacrifices for such an object, she in that way. It was the only way. Moreover, she would be able to see how it worked. Ill or well, she would avoid the horrible incertitude on the deathbed, but it was hard, hard, cruelly hard.